thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I want to add one footnote to my biography because there tends to be a bit of misunderstanding about this. As you can probably hear, I am absolutely British, English British. Um, but there is a sort of sense that because I hold some of the views that I hold um, and because my name is the, the name it is, um, that I'm somehow Russian. I'm not Russian. I'm married to a second generation um, Russian American and that's where the name comes from. Um, but I am absolutely straight down the line British and I learnt Russian um, and I'm a past Moscow correspondent, as was said. Um, I'm going to take, I feared that André was actually going to duplicate a lot of what I was going to say, but actually he hasn't. Um, in fact, he's cast doubt in a way on the whole thesis that trust is really necessary. <laughs> so maybe what I'm going to say about how I think that um, trust has broken down in recent years is maybe slightly less important if we think that trust is not the absolute prime essential um, for good relations. I'll also warn you in advance that um, as a journalist and a columnist, I'm going to be um, pretty straightforward, um, probably a bit arrogant and very opinionated. Um, so the register will probably need an injection of your um, academic and diplomatic nuance um, during questions. Um, in line with the sort of trendy um, social media journalism, I was actually intending to um, make my talk seven points. But when I got to seven, I'd still got some left, so there's actually going to be ten, um, which is much more conventional and much less trendy. Um, I called it the diktat of Cold War stereotypes, and that was a sort of emergency title because um, the organisers really wanted a title. Um, and in a way, it looks like an answer to the question of why trust broke down. Um, but I think it's worth elaborating on um, a lot of that um, and how it came to this. And that's what I'm going to do in the 10 points. Um, the first point, um, which I think is borne out by what we heard in the last session and um, some of what we heard this morning, was that there was never quite as much trust as was often believed. Yes, there were personal relationships, including the very important relationship between Reagan and Gorbachev that was forged at Geneva 30 years ago. But that didn't extend to all the staff on either side, nor did it survive beyond the departure of Gorbachev and the, uh, and the demise of the Soviet Union. By the end, too, Gorbachev himself was greatly disillusioned. His hopes, for instance, of economic assistance had been dashed at the London G7 plus one summit, summit, and I think he nursed that grievance really till the end of the Soviet Union. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that what, what one, of the, uh, one of the things that I took from um, Robert Service's book about the, uh, the, the end of the Cold War was the extent of disagreement and dissent on both sides, both what Gorbachev was up against and what Reagan was up against in members of, the, uh, in, in members of their own teams. And that came to the fore after the end of the Soviet Union. Second point, when Yeltsin took over, there was a lot of Western goodwill, but there was also an enormous lack of trust because Yeltsin was seen, especially I would say in mainstream diplomatic circles, as having undermined and ultimately overthrown the, West, the West's best friend, Gorbachev. As his drinking increased, his health declined and his be behavior became more unpredictable through the 1990s, distrust only grew. And it's sad, I think, but true, that Yeltsin was himself a factor in the growth of distrust between East and West. Third point, the change of the diplomatic guard that took place on both sides after the end of the Soviet Union, I think was really critical. There was a departure from the stage of those who had steered the world through the collapse of communism. Helmut Kohl, Gorbachev, Reagan, um, George Bush I, and crucially, I think, not just those people, but the partnership that Shevardnadze enjoyed, both with Schultz and then with Baker. Um, those partnerships actually 
really, they faded, they started to fade away, as I would see it, um, after the end of the Soviet Union. And a new generation um, took those positions who often seemed to me to lack the wisdom, the experience, and the word that we've heard a lot today, and actually I haven't heard very much before today in this context, empathy. Um, they simply lacked the ability or didn't see the usefulness of putting themselves in the position of the other party. Either they thought it was irrelevant or they didn't know how to do it. Um, and I think that was a huge loss. Now, of course, you can argue that um, the individuals who steered the relatively peaceful, miraculously peaceful end to the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, you could argue that maybe they weren't such outstandingly wise individuals to begin with, that individual political players rise to the challenge of extreme times, and the collapse of the Soviet Union was surely a manifestation of extreme times. Um, I think it's also, I'd like to add just um, one point to what was said today about the importance of um, personal relationships and one-to-one -one meetings and summits. Um, it was talked about how you could improve these by sort of frequent meetings, by incrementalism, by solving joint problems. I think one huge factor in the end of the Soviet Union, um, in the what you, I think with hindsight looks really the success generally of diplomacy, was sheer desperation. These were extraordinary times. There was huge drama. There was a risk that there was war and famine and enormous refugee problems were going to break out from one end of Europe to the Pacific coast. It's very hard to imagine that now, but these were extreme times which called for basically pulling up all preconceptions and starting again. And there was a freedom there um, which probably there isn't now. Now that is all at the state political level. Um, but I think the reasons for the breakdown of trust um, went rather further, um, which comes to my fourth point, which is that there was a change of guard in the media too. Um, and you could say that the late 80s, um, as well as being extraordinary times in all other respects, were also extraordinary times for reporting, um, especially on Russia and Eastern Europe. Those were the places to be. I was appointed to Moscow in 1987. I was then refused a visa for almost 18 months. But my appointment was, in a way, a sign of the times. In the past, at least in Britain, it had been almost unheard of for a Russia specialist to be sent to Moscow as the chief correspondent of um, an establishment paper. The then editor of the Times, Charlie Wilson, was as far from being an intellectual or a specialist as it was possible to be. But he took the decision, as did an increasing number of editors, that what were needed in Moscow were people who knew, the, who knew the country, who knew the language, and who could talk to people in their own language and read the press, which was then, listen, watch television, which was going through the most extraordinary ferment. The press, co press corps in Moscow, I said I was going to be arrogant as the Soviet Union collapsed, was perhaps the best qualified anywhere at any time in recent years. The rivalry was intense, but so was the camaraderie. And there was also something that there hadn't been before, which was the, the germ of cooperation between the Soviet and Russian media on the one hand and the international correspondents on the other. Now, what happened then was that most of us left during 1992, and I was probably not unique in feeling um, both exhausted and that having covered one of the stories of the 20th century, it was time to do something else. Russia was then no longer at the top of the media tree, and those who followed in journalism in Moscow from Western countries generally had less expertise less language, and most crucially to my mind, very little first-hand knowledge of what had come before. The reporting rapidly turned negative because people didn't know what, what, what a huge contrast life in 91, 92, 93 was, even with Russia in 1997, 1998, let alone what the majority of Russians had lived through 
I think that you can see something um, something similar, um, and this is my fifth point, um, in diplomacy and in academic Russian studies. Um, I think in academia there was a feeling that um, if not the if not history had ended, then at least um, Russian studies were going to be less important in future. And as I understand it, both um, money declined and potential students declined. Um, in diplomacy, and um, I'm probably speaking um, slightly out of turn about the British Foreign Office here. Um, that there was, first of all, the sense that the Cold War had collapsed, very much similar to, the, to, to academia. Um, but there was also, in parallel, a sort of growth of what I would call managerial, managerialism and the downgrading of area expertise. The reorganization of the Foreign Office Research Department along thematic lines like climate change, terrorism and the like um, caused a hemorrhage of specialist expertise not only, but most conspicuously, on Russia. It's only now, in two reports, um, parliamentary reports over the last 18 months, that this is recognised as the liability that it was. And in particular, there, there, there were not only very few people, able, fewer and fewer people, able to speak Russian and who were familiar with Russia, there was almost nobody whose job it was to consider how the world looked from the Kremlin. When Putin took over in 2000, the gulf of misunderstanding was already very wide. Uh, as a footnote to that, I would add that some of the mistranslation from Russian of Russian statements during the Ukraine crisis was absolutely scandalous and made the tensions considerably worse. Um, sixth point, I would say that the decline in expertise was compounded by a sort of natural human optimism. Um, there had been, in, in 91, um, with the collapse of communism across Europe, uh, completed by the collapse of the Soviet Union, expectations, I would say, throughout the West, including in Russia-watching circles, um, were very, very high. And these were inflated expectations that were bound to be disappointed. There were those who believed that Russia could be a vast S Scandinavia within a decade. Others asked why it couldn't at least be like Poland. But to anybody who knew the Soviet Union, the answer should have been obvious. But it was Russia that took the blame for falling so short of what many people had hoped. Um, I think it's, um, it's probably now clear that the changes, um, not, ma not changes in material standards of living, which have been enormous and dramatic and are often underestimated, but the changes in mentality are going to take, a much, take much, much longer. And that doesn't just apply to Russia, it also applies to East and Central Europe as well. Um, seventh point. Um, if you were based in Moscow, as most foreigners were, or dealt mainly with educated people in Moscow and St. Petersburg, it was very easy to fall back on the old stereotypes, to look at Russia and to say, well, basically nothing has changed. There's still the Tsar complex, the strong leader, the Russian bear, the sort of aggressiveness, um, and not recognized how much had changed. But I think many Russians felt, and I think they're right, that the West almost ignored the fact that with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the reassertion of Russia's existence as a, 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 as a sovereign state, that a huge amount had changed. There had been regime change in Russia to an extent similar to what had happened across East and Central Europe. But it wasn't recognized. It wasn't recognized in part because that regime change had actually also incorporated the reassertion of Russia over the republics, which led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, or at least in part led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in part because 
we'd got used to the people who were in charge of Russia, who switched their allegiance from the Soviet, from the Soviet um, mechanisms and structures to the Russian structures. And they, of course, kept their jobs. So the regime change was far less visible and obvious to many people in Russia than it was. Um, but I think that Russians felt that they were still treated and suspected as Soviets that we were very uh, we were very reluctant and blind to the fact that there really had been a break and that Russia was not the Soviet Union. Um, the last three points are sort of related. Um, point eight is the blindingly obvious one, which has been mentioned from time to time, which is, I think it's a, it was a huge mistake, but an understandable one, that NATO wasn't dissolved or at least recall, or at least called something else after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. I think it, that, that um, we know why that didn't happen. There was so much else going on. There was so much else that was urgent to be addressed, and there was huge pressure from the from the the Baltic states and the countries of Eastern Central Europe that they wanted um, to join what they saw as a security guarantee bloc. Um, but I think it was it was a big mistake, and it contributed hugely to the decline of trust. Um, something which I think is less appreciated, point nine, um, is European Union expansion. This is not because it encroached on Russia or Russia's interests. Um, it is because the European Union incorporated countries who brought with them an attitude to the Soviet, an attitude to Russia, which was basically an attitude, the attitude that they brought from their relations with the Soviet Union. It presupposed that Russia had aggressive intentions, and that changed the it changed the balance and it changed the um, the mentality and attitudes in the European Union as a whole. Um, and the tenth point is, I think, there is a huge um, dereliction of duty um, in the failure even to try to understand Putin. Um, he was pretty much demonized from the moment he took over from Yeltsin, um, in part because of the Chechen war and the sympathy, the, 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 the Western sympathies with the Chechen cause. And really things went downhill from there. Um, the failure of empathy, which had sort of, <coughs> we, 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 the, the, the lack of empathy, which had <coughs> decreased and decreased over the previous decade, um, reached its absolute climax um, with the demonize, demonization of Putin. And I think the particular failure was to misunderstand where the center of Russian politics was and the fact that Putin so w w was so adept at, um, at exemplifying it. Because what when you looked at it from the West, you said, um, Putin is a block on, as it were, the natural pro-Western liberal enlightened sentiments of Russians which are being frustrated and thwarted by, by this demon Putin. Now that is absolutely not how the, uh, the, the balance of forces stacks up in Russia. In those days, and up until about three years ago, Putin's main, uh, main adversaries, the main threat to Putin came from the political left. Um, as was seen in the demonstrations by the pensioners in 2004. Um, the main threat to Putin now, as I see it, comes from the nationalistic and expansionist expectations that have been raised because of Ukraine. In neither of those cases is Putin the chief enemy to the West. They are the, the, those two forces are the ones that threaten Putin, not the pro-Western liberals. That's all I'd like to say. <clears throat>